Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you all for joining today's um, webinar. We're going to give all webinar registrants just a few more minutes to log in and we're going to get started um, very, very soon. Just to make sure um, that everyone can see the cover slide and hear my voice clearly, if you don't mind um, putting in the chat box that you can hear me clearly. I currently see, um, all right, awesome. I see that you all can hear me loud and clear and there's a lot of shout outs. Wow, this chat box is beautiful. <laughs> we will get started very soon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we will get started in about one minute. I wanna thank you all for joining us for today's webinar um, entitled Black Maternal Health in the US COVID-19 Response. We are excited today because we have over 1,000 um, attendees for this um, wonderful webinar, and we're gonna get started literally in 30 seconds. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar entitled Black Maternal Health in the US COVID-19 Response, as presented by members of the Black Mamas Matter Alliance for our third annual Black Maternal Health Week. My name is Angela Ina, and I'm the current interim executive director at Black Maternal, excuse me, at Black Mamas Matter Alliance. And before we get started, I would like to cover some logistical items. Everyone is currently muted and will stay muted during the webinar. We will have time at the end for questions through the chat box. So feel free to submit any questions that arise throughout this webinar, and we will try our best to address them after this presentation. Please note that all webinars presented this week will be recorded and available for your viewing on our website. I want to take a moment to express our deep gratitude to all of this year's Black Maternal Health Week sponsors. We'd like to give a special recognition to our change maker level sponsors, the United Way of Greater Atlanta and Merck for Mothers and our movement builder level sponsors, City Match, Every Mother Counts, Vintner Daughters, and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Your investment in this campaign continues to help us make a significant impact. So a little bit about us. The Black Mamas Matter Alliance is a national network of Black women-led organizations and multidisciplinary professionals that work across the full spectrum of maternal and reproductive health. We operate at the national, state, and local levels 
um, to collaborate and to advance policy, promote holistic maternity care, cultivate research, and uplift culture to advance Black maternal health. We do all of this from a reproductive justice, birth justice, human rights, respectful maternity care perspective and framework. Of particular note, we use the phrase Black mamas to include a range of folks from women and birthing people across the African diaspora to those who care for and mother our families and our communities, whether they have themselves given birth or not. Founded by the Black Mamas Matter Alliance, the National Black Maternal Health Week campaign intentionally takes place in April, which is recognized in the US as National Minority Health Month. Additionally, we begin Black Maternal Health Week on April 11th annually to join dozens of global organizations in making this day as International Day for Maternal Health and Rights, an opportunity to advocate for the elimination of maternal mortality globally. For BMMA, we recognize maternal mortality as a global crisis affecting Black women across the world, not just in the United States. And we join other Black and African women leaders across the diaspora in the fight to end maternal mortality. The purpose of Black Maternal Health Week is to deepen the national conversation about Black maternal health so that public stakeholders understand how root causes like structural racism and gender oppression act as drivers of maternal health disparities. This year's theme is Centering Black Mamas, the Right to Live and Thrive. Centering Black Mamas and their right to live and thrive highlights the need for health practitioners to listen to Black Mamas in their care and service provision. This is especially important now that we have better data that provides further evidence that the lack of quality of care and disregard for Black women's humanity is deadly. By centering community-driven solutions, we can help Black women, their children, and families thrive. Our theme this year of centering Black Mama's right to live and thrive is especially timely. During this unnecessarily disastrous COVID-19 pandemic, it is appalling to witness and experience in real time the consequences of a lack of investment in the public health and emergency preparedness infrastructure of the United States. This has been very traumatizing and deadly for all vulnerable populations. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic is disproportionately affecting Black communities. It has further amplified existing healthcare inequities and has intensified the maternal health crisis in this nation. COVID-19 has laid bare the lack of uniform hospital policies permitting doulas and support persons to be present during labor and delivery. It has laid bare increased rates of cesarean section deliveries. It has laid bare shortened hospital state stays following delivery. Also, um, provider shortages and lack of sufficient policies to allow births, um, to allow home births attended by midwives. And it has laid bare insufficient practical support for delivery of care by midwives, including telehealth access. This is unacceptable. As a nation that spends billions of dollars on health care, we can and must do better, most especially in maternal and reproductive health care during this time. And now I am honored to have such a dynamic set of experts for today's webinar. First up, we have Dr. Monica McLemore. Dr. McLemore is an assistant professor in the Family Healthcare Nursing Department, a clinician scientist at Advancing New Standards in Reproductive Health, and a member of the Bixby Center for Global Reproductive Health 
at the University of California, San Francisco. She maintains a clinical practice at Zuckerberg San Francisco General. Dr. McLemore's program of research is focused on understanding the factors that influence the health, well-being, and livelihood of low-income and women of color. She currently serves as a member of BMMA's board. I will now turn it over to Dr. McLemore. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so grateful to be able to be here and speak with you today. Um, my name is Monica McLemore. As Angela uh, said, I use pronouns she, her, hers. Um, and you have my consent uh, to not only screenshot my slides, but also to share them. I want to, um, first of all, just shout out and thank everyone for being on this call. Um, I am super excited and I want to wish everybody a happy Black Maternal Health Awareness Week. And as Angela so eloquently pointed out, I want to talk about some public health implications for reproductive justice in the midst of COVID-19. For people who were able to join us on our tweet chat earlier today, you saw many people from around the country talking about some important concepts that I want to be able to break down for folks. But the ultimate and the penultimate takeaway for me, if you learn nothing from anything that I say today, is that human rights um, are not abandoned uh, during pandemics. And so as we think through, you know, how decisions that we have to make and, and resource allocation and other types of really difficult conversations, human rights need to be centered in addition to the rights of birthing uh, people and the communities in which they live. Next slide, please. I want to give a shout out in a brief moment within my presentation to recognize uh, Mama Claudia Booker, who is a mentor to many of us and, and to the birthing community. Um, because we can't know where we're going in the future if we don't know our past. And this was a huge loss for our community. And I really want to be able to acknowledge that on this webinar. Next slide, please. Let me talk a little bit about novel coronavirus because we are seeing quite a bit of information. It's coming rapidly. And I'll also warn anybody on this webinar, my slides are already dated and I sent them on Friday of last week. That's how rapidly information is moving. And so in places where it is dated, I will uh, update it. We had an incredible uh, grand rounds this morning um, through the University of California, San Francisco Department of Epidemiology and Biostats. And I will tell you that this information is moving quickly. I'll have some new resources that I'll also put in the chat box when I'm, I'm done with my slides. What novel means is new. We had never seen, we've seen coronaviruses before. The most recent one we've seen was SARS. Um, but I will tell you that when we, when we say novel or new, it means that it has not been identified in humans um, to cause illness or disease. And so just as a point of clarification, yes, we've seen uh, coronaviruses before. Um, and and uh, uh, Tedros from uh, the World Health Organization designated this virus as SARS-CoV uh, version two um, which we abbreviate as coronavirus disease of 2019, and it's abbreviated COVID-19. Next slide, please. I want to quickly review uh, viral transmission. It's been very interesting to watch, at least on social media, how a lot of people became armchair epidemiologists without really understanding some basic principles about viral transmission. The first of which is antibiotics are not effective uh, against viruses. Antibiotics work against bacteria. Number two, in order to have viral transmission, you need to have three things. You need to have a source. And in other words, someone who's been infected, you need to have a susceptible person, someone who is not currently infected, and you need to be able to understand the different ways that that transmission occurs. And for individuals who don't understand uh, viral transmission, just be aware that this information is moving very, very rapidly. But we do believe that uh, COVID-19 uh, can be aerosolized, meaning that um, it can live in the air, uh, that it is airborne. Uh, we've seen uh, some case studies around uh, droplet exposure means that if droplets are on solid surfaces, uh, that they can become infective. Um, and again, going back to surfaces, we've seen uh, issues around uh, countertops and cardboard, given you know the need to transition to uh, food delivery and grocery delivery, and and what the best science is, is showing us is that uh, COVID nineteen can live uh, between twenty four uh, and forty eight hours um, on surfaces. So just to be mindful of that. Uh, next slide, please. In this also midst of misinformation, we also want to be really really clear about public health one hundred and one. 
there's been a lot of discussion around social distancing or physical distancing, but everyone should understand that that actually should have been the fourth step. Uh, we had to go to, to the big hammer or the big sledgehammer uh, when we could have just really used a nail, but we had to move to that because our public health infrastructure has been so decimated, as Angela pointed out. In conditions or optimal conditions, you would, we would have had epidemiological tools available to us, which is another reason why uh, people are having conversations about why don't we have testing. We are literally flying, flying blind in understanding, you know, who actually are carriers, who are incubators, and trying to think through the constellation of individuals that they potentially could be exposing. So one of the reasons why testing is so important is to give us an idea of how exposed individuals are and or have been. That said, we could have had an opportunity, had we had appropriate testing, to be able to do contact tracing. We do this in sexually transmitted infections and we do this in other types of infectious agents like TB. Contact tracing means that you find the person who actually has been exposed that you know have disease and then you map out the individuals that they potentially could have been around in that infectious period. We do know that it takes between five and 14 days for COVID to show up. So really mapping all those potential interactions allows you a smaller range of individuals that potentially could have been quarantined and surveilled. But we missed an opportunity to be able to do that. These are basic public health 101 principles of epidemiology that we use in lots of other places, but because the seriousness and the communication, uh, the science communication around COVID-19 was so uh, bungled, is a word that I would use, that we had to go to the heavy hitting of shelter in place for everyone uh, because we couldn't use some of these more upstream tools. Next slide, please. So I would like to talk about a failed public health response. Um, and I think it's super important that we talk about our current situation. Next slide, please. We have had failures of action, surveillance, detection, and quarantine. We've had information failures, and we also have equipment failures. Many of us in public health have been arguing for years that a simple way to be able to access service, not only for rural populations, but also for, for vulnerable populations, was to be able to have Medicaid, and I like to remind everybody that half the births in the United States, people use Medicaid coverage, should cover telehealth visits and services. And that, that just did not happen until we got in the midst of a pandemic. And so for people who, you know, are on this webinar and who are really, really bubbling around different great and what used to be bold and innovative ideas, I can tell you some of us have been really amazed to see that the historic lack of political will for things that we know that can improve public health have been enacted in a very short amount of time. So my call to action for everyone on this webinar is in the future, if people say that we can't do things, we actually should really point back to this moment in time to show that many things that we thought were not possible in public health have very rapidly been able to be optimized, whether it's clinicians working across state lines um, without uh, attention to their whatever state licensure they have, all the way through being able to provide re Medicaid reimbursement, enhance reimbursement for telehealth visits. Uh, so many of the things that we thought was impossible not just two months ago have really been enacted. And, and I hope that we can keep that spirit of creativity as we continue to march through uh, COVID-19. Next slide, please. I want to put up some data because I, as a scientist and as a, as a geeky nerd, it would be, you know, weird if I did not put up some, some data. And I think this is really, really important. These were early release data, um, really trying to get at, and this is from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, really trying to get to the characteristics of patients who've been hospitalized with laboratory confirmed COVID disease. And I really think that one of the things that we need to hammer through, again, second call to action to this group of people is we need data by race and ethnicity. Next slide, please, and I'll show you why. If you look at the characteristics of patients um, hospitalized with COVID-19, this is only as of last uh, Thursday, um, you will see that the proportion of uh, white people who have been diagnosed um, uh, with, with laboratory positive COVID in 14 hospitals 
Um, and you look at black people as well as Latinx and Hispanic folks, and you will see that proportioning based on the proportions of, of individuals in the United States population, but also in the areas hardest hit for COVID, that again, we see that sort of reperpetuation of the disproportionate burden of disease on black and brown communities, which again is only highlighting things that we already know in public health around the structural barriers that contribute to the social determinants of health. Next slide, please. I also will say that we need to not also accept the narrative that men are disproportionately uh, impacted by COVID. I know originally people, you know, had myths that were going around saying, oh, this is a disease of men and this is a disease of old people. But if you really look at the people who have been hospitalized and have laboratory positive disease, whether they're intubated or not, you will notice that the distribution of patients is actually pretty similar across gender. And you will also notice that, yes, with underlying comorbidities, people have a higher propensity to actually, you know, have complications from COVID-19. But that's not in and of itself mutually exclusive, nor does it ex exclusively explain the overrepresentation of black and brown individuals in the context of understanding COVID-19. Next slide, please. This article, again, came out from the Brookings Institute. It came out last week. Uh, again, calling for disaggregated data, uh, race, uh, data by race and ethnicity. And this actually followed the letter from the Congressional Black Caucus, led by Ayanna Presley out of Maine, really asking us to be able to look at data. Now, you could argue so many people have built their careers on talking about racial and ethnic disparities, and people have built careers talking about social determinants and health. Why during a pandemic would people not want to see th those data by those characteristics? And you can argue that, you know, people are worried and concerned when you see data coming out of Chicago, when you see data coming out of St. Louis, when you see data coming out of New York City, and when you see data that's coming out of Louisiana and other states, where the bulk of the individuals who have not only been exposed, but who also uh, have died are, are overrepresented by black and brown communities. And people know that that is yet further justification and rationalization for the disproportionate uh, access to healthcare and healthcare services in the United States. Next slide, please. I, this was recent last week. Um, we've actually had more data added to it yesterday on Easter Sunday. And I will tell you, just in, in the states that were actually reporting uh, uh, data by race and ethnicity, you know, you will see that, you know, Black people are overrepresented in terms of the COVID-19 positive diagnoses in proportion to the percentage of people who are, uh, Black people who are in these states. And so to me, again, it sort of lays bare, as Angela uh, pointed out, the sort of, you know, structural racism that is currently embedded in her, not only health services provision, but is being amplified by a failure of public health response. Next slide, please. Let's vision for the future. I know that sounds very strange in the midst of the pandemic, but the decisions that we make now will have lifelong implications for many of us who are in clinical health services and public health. And I think, you know, it is very important for us to pay attention and not act out, act out of fear and not to exclusively be reactive, particularly when we know that there are historic injustices injustices that have contributed to why we're seeing data that we're seeing now. We actually have a watershed moment to think about how we can make this all different in the future. I wrote this piece for Scientific American when New York City decided that they were no longer going to allow birthing people to have accompaniment. And I will tell you, remind everyone on this call that we have four, estimated 4 million births a year in the United States. It's the number one reason why people are admitted to hospitals for childbirth. And so next slide, please. Instead of talking about the numbers of people that we should or should not uh, be able to allow with birthing people, arguments like this keep us from having a different conversation. And that different conversation should have been, you know, if birthing people are the number one reason why folks go into the hospital, and historically they have been the healthiest people coming into the hospital. And if we think about childbirth as a normal physiological process, then why can't we think outside the box in terms of a weird birthing should be receiving care in a pandemic? And so for me, I really want us to focus on 
innovative solutions that we potentially could be using to be able to navigate this situation and circumstance. I'll give you two. We are currently using com uh, a contract uh, contact tracing, we could reinvigorate the entire public health workforce if we really, really could, could mar match technology along with being on the ground, shoe leather epidemiology to really, really uh, create a situation where we're no longer flying blind and to redeploy the public health workforce to be able to be tracking COVID uh, uh, deaths and events. The second piece is we can really disrupt and innovate the maternity health care space and health services provision space by doing things like having telehealth visits with doulas and midwives, really being able to build out home birth and, and birth center birth and be able to have tent and drive through prenatal screening. And we could be thinking about group prenatal care in the context of a webinar, particularly in the sense that we have a thousand people on this call right here. How could we create new ways of community that, that are community driven as well as completely local? Uh, that's where I want us to start our thinking. So I'll end with again, you know, a call to action and I'll have my last slide come up. Call to action is do not exclusively make decisions out of fear and do not make decisions as reactions. This is shining a bright light on structural racism and we have an opportunity to make this different. What remains permanent is up to us. What we demand both as a healthcare community, as a public health workforce and as citizens. You know, the fact that we can actually have clinicians going across state lines, we could make that permanent. It's already true in the military. Why can't we just do that in the civilian workforce? Pitting healthcare workers against the people we serve is a novice move. People who know me on social media know that I think this. We could have all, the conversation really should have been, how can we all get out of this without increased COVID exposure, right? This idea that, that, that some of us are gonna win and some of us aren't gonna make it out of this, that to me is a really sort of novice way to think about how we could actually get through this. And I also want everyone to be careful and be mindful of what leaders, what organizations, and where your data sources are coming from. Particularly if people are willing to throw human rights and reproductive justice out the window, uh, during a pandemic, we actually should really, really not be reinforcing that behavior and should really be demanding that now is the time when leadership and principles matter. With that, I'm very much looking forward to any questions that you have, and I'm going to turn it over to my good colleague, collaborator, and friend, uh, Dr. Jamila Perry. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, Monica McLemore. Next is Dr. Jamila Perry. Dr. Parrott is a fellowship trained, board certified obstetrician and gynecologist with a comprehensive background in family planning and reproductive health. Dr. Parrott provides on the ground community-based care focus, focusing primarily on the intersection of sexual health, reproductive rights, and social justice. In addition to her work as a clinical provider in Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, she serves as a reproductive health care consultant where she develops, organizes, and facilitates health education workshops and outreach events focused on topics such as health equity, reproductive justice, adolescent health, contraception, and family planning. I will now turn it over to Dr. Perry. Thank you so much for that introduction, Angela, and thank you all for joining us. I'm also excited to have an opportunity to talk with you all uh, this afternoon. So my role here is to talk a bit about the impact of COVID-19, um, the pandemic on abortion access. As was mentioned, I'm Dr. Parrott. I'm an OBGYN and an abortion provider in the District of Columbia. Uh, Dr. Mapplemore, we heard her speak in her introduction about the widespread and expansive nature of the COVID-19 pandemic and how it's impacted care throughout the healthcare system. And we have truly seen the existing inequities in our systems and structures just really manifested and exacerbated and magnified a thousand fold by this pandemic. And delivery of abortion care has been no exception. Next slide. Just by way of grounding, I wanna make sure that we're on the same page and the language that we're using. Abortions in the US are typically categorized in two ways. Surgical abortion, sometimes called an in-clinic or a suction abortion, and medication abortion. 
the surgical abortion is what most people think about when we talk about having an abortion with your healthcare provider or in a clinic setting. It starts out as a kind of like a pap test where you have an exam and the speculum is inserted. And then the provider gently stretches or open your cervix and removes the pregnancy with suction. It usually takes about five to 10 minutes. Now, a medication abortion is where the pregnant person takes two sets of pills and passes the pregnancy at home. Many people describe this experience as a miscarriage, like a miscarriage or a really bad period. Abortion with medication was approved by the FDA in 2000, and it's becoming a more commonly chosen method. So right after FDA approval, only about 5% of abortions were done with medication, for example, and now it makes up about 39% of all abortions performed in the U.S. Based on most recent data reported by the Guttmacher Institute, about 862,000 abortions are performed each year, and it's estimated that about 70,000 people seek abortion care on average in the U.S. each month. Abortion is one of the safest procedures performed in the U.S., and it's also one of the most common. About 18% of all pregnancies, excluding miscarriage, end in abortion. So we know that given one in four women will have an abortion by the age of 45, there's not one specific kind of person that has an abortion. We do know that most are already parenting and have at least one child, and many are young people. More than half of, the US, of all U.S. abortion patients are in their 20s, and adolescents make up about 12% of people having abortions in the United States. And although the need for abortion care traverses race and ethnicity, income, and socioeconomic status, some communities have greater rates of abortion than others for a number of reasons. People who have abortions are disproportionately those with low incomes or living in poverty. And about 75% of abortion patients report having an income at or below the federal poverty level. And people of color make up about 62% of people having abortions each year. Next slide. People seeking abortions face a number of barriers in accessing care, including legislative restrictions, financial obstacles, and social stigma. Barriers to accessing abortion care are even steeper for people of color, for young people, undocumented folks, and other historically marginalized communities. These barriers are compounded when delays in care occur because the pregnancy continues to advance. Many people are forced to pay out of pocket for their care, and abortion may or may not be covered by insurance, or an individual may not be able to use their insurance to pay for it. As they work to raise the money for the abortion, delays result. And we know that abortions later in pregnancy typically cost more than those performed at earlier gestational ages. Delays are likely to create huge obstacles in obtaining care um, at all for those who have limited financial resources. We know that logistics present an additional challenge. Many people who are seeking abortion care have to arrange childcare or traveling from long distance to access services. They're navigating a number of systemic barriers to care. Things like lost wages, the need for time off for work and accommodations all result in significant delays. As the gestational age increase, clinic and provider availability also decrease because many providers are only trained to do abortions during the first trimester and many clinics only offer care during the first trimester as well. So the number of clinics that provide and providers that can do abortions begins to decline as the gestational age increases. These are all worsened by the continued hostile legal landscape in many parts of the country. Based on the Guttmacher estimates, 29 states are considered hostile toward abortion rights. And this impacts almost 60% of U.S. women of reproductive age. So that's 40 million women living in these states. In contrast, only 35% of the total, or 24 million women of reproductive age, live in states that are supportive of abortion rights. So from gestational age bans and total abortion bans, waiting periods, admitting privileges, those with the greatest need are often most impacted by barriers to care. And then when we look at these inequities and in access in the context of COVID, the intersections of these inequities become even more magnified. Next slide. We heard a lot about this with Dr. McElmore already in her fantastic presentation. And at this point, I don't think anyone would disagree that the response at the federal level has been poor at best and criminal at worst. There's a lack of coordinated response. And when that's coupled with inadequate testing and surveillance of disease, we have really seen this pandemic flourish. And although we're all at risk, there's certainly some communities that are experiencing disparate exacerbation of risk, exposure, and infection. And a growing number of advocates and activists have called on the CDC, the Surgeon General, and state governments 
to do as Dr. McElmore mentioned and report the rates of infection and death through an equity lens, which would include reporting race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and other sociodemographic information. Dr. McElmore gave us a wonderful view of this disproportionate burden, burden of disease in our communities. And in the few states that have done so, we see that the, re the results are stark in looking at these inequities that are inherently built, I'll remind you, in our healthcare system. We saw that in the last couple of weeks, Milwaukee reporting, for example, that 81% of deaths related to COVID are black folks who only make up 26% of that population. And similarly in Chicago, 70% of COVID-related deaths are black people who only comp comprise 19% of the population. Some public health experts and healthcare providers have offered explanations for these inequalities. And by far, the most commonly repeated explanation for differences in the rates of death of people of color infected with COVID has been racial inequities in chronic conditions. And that's to say that black people have higher rates of chronic disease, like high blood pressure or diabetes, and this puts them at higher rates for contracting and dying from the virus. It's really important that we understand that this is only part of the story. While it's true that black people and other marginalized communities are more likely to develop chronic conditions at earlier ages and more likely to die younger, the reasons that this is the case are the same reasons that black people in the U.S. have a disproportionately high rate of maternal death and lower access to medical care. Our analysis of these inequities in COVID infection and death must include a discussion of the interlocking and intersections of oppression, things like environmental injustice and economic injustice, Racism and racial inequity predispose some communities to higher rates of disease than others. Relying on these partial narratives that blame the individual for engaging in high-risk behavior to explain these inequities is not just irresponsible, it's dangerous. A more complete assessment includes addressing inequities in healthcare access and implicit bias and discrimination within our healthcare system, acknowledging the impact of historical and present day segregation in our community, of economic inequity and environmental injustice. Inequity in the ability of some communities to access high quality health services are often divided along racial and economic lines. Black folks and other marginalized racial groups are experiencing differential treatment that also affects the quality of care we receive. And this puts entire communities at a disadvantage when seeking testing, diagnosis, medication, and high quality, timely care. As healthcare facilities around the country begin to reach capacity with COVID infections mount, access to limited life-saving care will inevitably lead to racialized opportunities for survival. Next slide. While in the U.S., the right to access abortion was codified into law with Roe v. Wade in 1973, the ability to actualize this right is far from equitable. We reviewed the numbers earlier and saw that many communities have higher rates of abortion than others. And there is not just one single reason for these differences. People of color and those who have low incomes or living in poverty are less likely to have access to quality, culturally responsive, comprehensive reproductive health care, including access to contraception if they need or want it. These communities are also more likely to experience bias and discrimination when seeking health care services and more likely to have experienced reproductive rights abuses at an individual or a community level. And as a result, often report distrust in the healthcare system and providers more broadly. All of these things can impact the ability or desire of an individual to access reproductive healthcare services and may impact the need for an abortion. When you add to that a decimated social safety net that inhibits an individual's ability to parent the children they have in safe and healthy environments, the need for abortion increases. Reducing barriers in the ability to access abortion care in a timely manner is critical to the health and safety of individuals seeking care. Delays in access to services increases the risk that an individual may experience a medical complication and in all cases negatively impact their social, emotional, and psychological well-being overall. So where does this leave, it, leave us? What are our options for communities that have a greater need for abortion services but are also least likely to be able to access the care we need. Next slide. Reproductive health care providers and the clinics and facilities where we work continue to be committed to protecting the health of our communities and taking necessary precautions to keep patients safe and staff safe and healthy during this crisis. Certainly the basics of physical distancing are applied to the extent possible. And in many health centers, 
in clinics, this looks like limiting physical contact between individuals. Sometimes this is limiting the number of staff present in the health center or in a room at any point in time, or limiting the number of support persons able to accompany an individual to their appointment or be in the room during their abortion. We've also seen some places limit the service they provide to those deemed essential or urgent. This is an extension of a mandate issued by the CDC as a way to promote physical distancing and limit the use of personal protective equipment for cases when necessary. Unfortunately, we saw some organizations and states and individuals using this as a tactic to eliminate abortion access completely. States have tried to shut down abortion clinics and stop abortions done in hospital settings by claiming that folks who need abortions are seeking non-essential services. This is in direct contradiction to statements made by leading medical organizations, including the American College of OBGYNs, who call for hospital systems surgical facilities, and other community-based health systems to recognize that abortion is an essential, time-sensitive service. Where care continues, we've seen clear changes in the way care is delivered. Health screening and follow-up is done, being done via telephone when possible, and less is occurring face-to-face, -face, requiring folks to limit their travel to their provider's office. And this includes increased use of things like telemedicine and online services. Next slide. Even as the care model changes, though, inequities remain. As occurs in a time of crisis, most solutions to date are really grounded in immediate need. How do we stay open? How can we make sure that some people are able to get the care they need in a timely fashion? For those of us who approach our work with an equity lens, we're pushing folks to move past the immediate to seek sustainable solutions that benefit those most impacted. This requires movement beyond a single issue analysis. So not just asking how can we keep clinics open, but what does abortion care look like, or more importantly, what could or should it look like for those who can't make it to the clinic to get their care or would rather take care of themselves at home? As we're instituting changes in our healthcare system, are we also examining policies and procedures that reproduce and perpetuate past and current injustices? Are we promoting isolation of individuals in their care and separation from their communities? Are we grounding our solutions in a reproductive justice framework that demands transformation of power structures and system dynamics that inhibit the ability of an individual to control their reproductive destiny? I offer that this moment may be a unique opportunity to begin that process in the delivery of abortion care. I love that Dr. McElmore discussed the need to move from responses grounded in fear and scarcity in order to see change. Next slide. The need to demedicalize abortion care is something that many advocates and activists have been calling for for quite some time. The moment of this pandemic has forced us to do so in many ways. The medical evidence supports this. Studies have shown that mandating blood work and ultrasound, for example, as a universal part of practice limits access. And eliminating them and replacing them with self-screening does not universally increase the risk for most people. Strategies for continuing to provide care during the pandemic rely on this evidence to support new protocols. This opens the door from moving medication abortion over the, over the counter or by mail to broaden access to care and also for supporting those who want or need to self-manage their abortion. The need for clinic-based care remains important in this context though. This is not an either or, but a both and. And this means that there's an increased need for things like logistical support for those seeking clinic-based care. Advocating for funding for abortions, whether it's through the National Network of Abortion Funds or removal of insurance restrictions on abortion coverage, like the Hyde Amendment, are necessary. But it also means understanding the role of paid family leave, of pay equity, and supporting access to health care as a fundamental human right. Next slide. When we look at abortion care and the impact of COVID in this context of this framework, we see a clear need to make room for and consider the complexities around reproductive rights and health in this endeavor. As we continue to build and advocate for programs in our own cities, states, and communities, it's critical that we introduce these complexities into every conversation we have about access to and provision of abortion care. This includes grounding our work in history the history of this country, and the history of the community. The reality is that those with limiting access to abortion care are the same communities who are most heavily impacted by COVID infection and death, and this is not a coincidence. It's the result of centuries of institutional and structural inequity. 
meaningfully exercising the right to abortion care must occur in the context that supports reproductive health and more importantly, reproductive justice. The importance of holding fast to this context as we protect and expand access to abortion must be intentional. And it's absolutely necessary for seeking solutions to address these inequities in any meaningful or sustainable way. Next slide. Thank you so much for your time. And I'm more than happy to answer questions when we're done and turn it over to our next wonderful presenter. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jamila Parrott. We will now hear from Dr. Ifen Yewa Asiado. Dr. Asiado is a researcher, res registered nurse, and lactation consultant. She currently serves as an assistant professor of family care nursing at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Asiado is extremely passionate about improving breastfeeding rates in Black communities and centers her research on the intersection of race, gender, family dynamics, life course, and breastfeeding. I will now turn it over to Dr. Asiado. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for that introduction, Angela. Again, my name is Ifeanwa Asiadu, and I am an assistant professor at UCSF in the School of Nursing. And it is my pleasure to be with you all today to discuss uh, infant feeding in the era of COVID-19. Next slide, please. Dr. Asiadu, it seems like we may have lost your audio. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, can hear you now. Okay, great. Um, next slide, please. For some reason, the slides are not moving. Okay, on our, on my end, there we go. Key points, okay. Okay. Um, so first, I want to thank the Black Mamas Matter Alliance for the invitation to present today, especially on the topic that is so important and often not disclosed. Um, I have no relevant financial relationships or anything that I will be discussing today. Um, in regard to objectives, I am going to talk with you all about the significance of human milk, uh, COVID-19 and its impact in, on infant feeding resources, and I'm happy to answer any questions you all may have. Um, if you don't take away anything from this presentation, these are the major key points that I really want you to come away from this presentation with. Breastfeeding, chest feeding, and the expression of human milk are still important now, more so than ever during this pandemic. Uh, current World Health Organization and CDC recommendations are supportive of breastfeeding, chest feeding, and the expression of human milk and resources and support are available. I'll talk a little bit more about the transition to telehealth, online, virtual, and phone assistance. Next slide, please. I do wanna take a moment to acknowledge the impact of COVID-19. COVID-19 has presented a number of challenges from increased illness and death to job loss and security to physical and social distancing, shelter in place orders. It is quite understandable that there, that if you are currently pregnant or recently have given birth or are caring for or providing services to those who are pregnant or recently given birth that you're experiencing a range of emotions right now. And I wanna say that your feelings are valid. This is quite an uncertain time. And folks may have a number of questions as it relates to how to properly feed a baby or an infant during a pandemic. And honestly, we're learning so much more and more every day, as my colleagues have pre previously shared. The way in which information is turning over is constant. Every 24 hours, there are new recommendations or guidelines that are being released. Um, however, it's important to note that the current COVID-19 pandemic has significantly impacted the ways individuals, families, and communities access and receive perinatal education, support, and resources. But I also think it's important to note that a number of health systems, individuals, and organizations are still trying to provide critical maternal and child health services and education during this challenging time. Next slide, please. 
I also want to share and acknowledge that through my research in clinical practice, I've learned that infant feeding means something different for everyone. And I think it's really important to acknowledge and identify what infant feeding means to you, in addition to your patients, families, and communities that you'll be working with. Um, however, for the purposes of this presentation, I'll primarily be focusing on breastfeeding, chest feeding, and the expression of human milk. Next slide, please. Breastfeeding and chest feeding are protective of women, birthing individuals, and infants' health across their life course. Suboptimal breastfeeding, and what we mean by that is not breastfeeding at, exclusively breastfeeding at the recommended six-month exclusivity and up to a year um, per, per the American Academy of Pediatrics, and up to two years if we're looking at the World Health Organization um, guidelines and recommendations. So suboptimal breastfeeding has significant health consequences uh, and health care costs. Women and birthing individuals who breastfeed lower their risk of type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and uterine and breast cancers, whereas infants who are breastfed are less likely to experience ear infections, asthma, respiratory and gastrointestinal infections, and also develop diabetes and obesity later in life. Thus, as we're talking about breastfeeding and the expression of human milk, it really should be thought of as a reproductive right and a reproductive health issue and public health intervention to improve and sustain black maternal health. Next slide, please. So when we're thinking about and discussing breastfeeding or chest feeding in black communities, oftentimes what is highlighted is uh, breastfeeding disparities. And while I think that's important to note the data, I think it's also important to note that disparities do not occur in a vacuum. We have to identify and acknowledge the systemic barriers and challenges to racism in addition, such as racism, in addition to inequities to access and resources, and preventing individuals and families from meeting their infant feeding and chest feeding goals. I think that is very important because oftentimes folks want to focus on the disparities and say that Black women and Black birthing individuals are not breastfeeding, and that isn't the case. We have to take a step back and really think of the context in which Black pregnant and birthing individuals are coming to the decision or the choice of infant feeding and how they're being supported. And I think while it's important to highlight what the current state data shows, we also have to highlight that black breastfeeding and chest feeding rates have been improving and increasing over the last 10 years. And so we know that black mamas are breastfeeding and chest feeding. Next slide, please. And you can skip that. Um, so, in regard to why we're here today, uh, what do we know about COVID-19? And I don't want to exacerbate or go over what colleagues have previously before have already shared. Dr. McLemore and Dr. Parrott have eloquently shared um, in regard to what we know about COVID-19. I will just reiterate in terms of it's a respiratory transmission, droplets in the air, typically person to person. Uh, but we know that there's no vaccine and researchers are working hard to identify drugs and medications to treat those who are currently ill. Primarily, transmission is through, um, as I stated before, um, at the moment, the primary public health and clinical interventions to mitigate and prevent the spread of COVID-19 are to practice good respiratory hygiene, wearing a mask out in public, Frequent hand washing and hand hygiene, no shaking hands, using hand sanitizer uh, when that's available and practicing physical and social distancing. Next slide, please. So what do we know about the maternal child transmission of COVID-19? Um, at this time, very little is known about the maternal to child transmission. There have been a few studies conducted that have provided interim guidance during this pandemic. Of particular interest are the studies that have examined human milk. To date, nine studies have been conducted related to COVID-19 in human milk. Of the nine, all but two were conducted in China. 
So far, no COVID-19 or coronavirus has been found or detected in human milk. And I think that's very important to note. There's been no virus found in human milk. And folks are theorizing that may be the case that um, the bioactives in human milk may interact with the virus to provide some type of buffer against severe clinical disease. Uh, thus, breastfeeding expression of human milk are still recommended during this time. And as we speak, there are colleagues throughout the United States currently collecting human milk from COVID-19 positive and persons under investigation, individuals to be studied. And hopefully we'll know more um, and have more insights shortly. Next slide, please. So again, reiterating what I discussed earlier, colostrum, or sometimes it's called liquid gold, but also known as the infant's first vaccine because of the immunological properties, also can be viewed as personal medicine. Nursing, breastfeeding, chest feeding, and the expression of use of expressed milk all provide immunological benefits and protection for the infant, as well as providing and improving the health of the lactating person across the life course. And as you can see, there are a number of protections, not only in regard to COVID-19, but there's still other infections and diseases that we should still be concerned about at this time, that breastfeeding and the expression of human milk protect infants against. Next slide, please. And I think it's also important to note what we are experiencing now is an emergency. More specifically, it is called infants and young child feeding during emergencies. And I'm really grateful for colleagues such as Dr. Anshley Palmquist um, at UNC Chapel Hill for doing such important work in this field and really highlighting how critical it is that we still provide human milk, breastfeeding, chest feeding resources, access to donor human milk, and support those who are formula feeding in addition to milk sharing during this very critical time. Um, and it's important to note that we have recommendations and guidelines to support breastfeeding, chest feeding, and expression of human milk during this pandemic and all other types of emergencies. And as you can see, the World Health Organization, the CDC, the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, and yes, I will provide the links to all of these in um, the chat at the end of my um, talk. Habana and the International Society for Research in Human Milk and Lactation have all provided recommendations and resources to support um, this particular infant feeding. Next slide, please. And in addition to recommendations, these recommendations, as I said, they're still supportive of breastfeeding, chest feeding, and the expression of human milk. In the cases of an individual being COVID positive or a person under investigation, um, separation is something that is an option and is being discussed, but I think it needs to be an informed discussion, not even that I think it needs to be, it should be an informed discussion between the provider and that individual and their support person. These type of decisions should be shared decision making. Um, in addition to also highlighting the importance of respiratory um, and hand hygiene and breast hygiene. In addition, something that we're not talking enough about, we really need to talk about what type of plans for outpatient practices and support and resources for individuals who are COVID positive or PUI. Ideally, this individual will be well enough to be discharged and go home with their infant. What type of plans and support and resources and supplies are being provided to them and their family to ensure that they're able to not only provide express human milk or breastfeed or chest feed, but that they're also doing so safely to prevent any type of transmission of COVID-19 to their infants. Next slide, please. And so when we think about some of the recommendations that have been coming down and some of my colleagues um, previously have already spoken to, the risk of routine mandatory um, separation during intrapartum, I really want us to acknowledge that, and I want to acknowledge too that COVID-19 um, has presented a number of competing priorities. 
not only for hospitals, clinics, and community-based organizations. However, I think it's now more than ever, it's important for us not to forget the importance and significance of human milk, right? And in thinking about these um, separation uh, recommendations or practices, we also have to really think about the impact not only on breastfeeding, chest feeding, and nursing. The separation will impact and will disrupt lactation. But we also have to think about the impact on bonding, bonding and attachment between the dyad. What also, what type of psychological harm and trauma are we causing for individuals? And we also have to consider what type of messaging are we sending to a birthing parent or person when the first act they experience is of separation and or being told that they are not able to feed their babies in the way in which they had planned to. We have to think about the trauma that those individuals are going to incur, not only in that moment, but the impact across the life course and also the long-term impacts for that dyad. In addition to, as was previously mentioned by my colleagues, we have to mention the historical impl implementa implications to separation of mothers and birthing infants from each other and not giving them access to provide the important skin to skin, that bonding, the different things that all individuals have a right to do with their infants. We have to be thinking about the importance of those things. And we have to be thinking about the long-term negative impacts to population health um, if we continue to practice these um, recommendations. Next slide, please. So how do we ensure that we are centering Black mamas' infant feeding needs and priorities during the COVID-19 pandemic? Next slide. We have to assess, educate, and reorient and advocate. In terms of assess, what does infant, we have to ask open-ended questions in regard to what does infant feeding mean to you or the individual or family that you're providing services to. Now is not the time to make assumptions that black women are not breastfeeding. We know that this is false. Black women are black women and birthing people are breastfeeding and they want to breastfeed and or chest feed or provide expressed human milk for their infants. We really need to provide patient centered care, even during this pandemic. Now is not the time to take away individuals rights to information and shared decision making. Education is still very critical, regardless of the infant feeding method identified individuals and families need accurate information. Providing proper formula bottle making techniques is important as diluting a formula and adding too much formula can impact the health and well being of the infant, baby, or child. We also need to provide the most up to date information and resources when available. In addition, giving the current pandemic reorientation of expectations is critical that anticipatory guidance in regard to what to know or experience when one is going in to a hospital setting and or post discharge is going to be critical uh, to mitigate and reduce the in, per, uh, in person uh, to mitigate and reduce the spread of COVID-19. Hospitals, clinics and organizations and individuals have canceled their in person breastfeeding chest feeding education classes. Some folks have shifted um, to providing virtual online or telephone education or support. And it's important to identify what type of services are still being provided, when and how, in your communities. And I will also say with this, uh, while there is this big emphasis in transition to telehealth, providing online and virtual support and services, which I applaud, I also think we did a disservice to individuals by not assessing what type of access they have to internet and uh, so smartphones and devices within their homes. We forget that there are still huge disparities in regards to who has access to Wi-Fi in their homes and the places in which individuals typically would access Wi-Fi and in, in regard to a library, a coffee shop. Um, some cities have access to free Wi-Fi. Some county buildings have access to Wi-Fi. Um, here in my area, even the Target has Wi-Fi. But we know now that a lot of those places are inaccessible to people due to physical and social distancing 
um, orders. And so we have to really think, how are we making sure that even if we are providing these online virtual telehealth services, that the people who need them also have access to the tools and devices and resources to be able to continue to use them. Next slide, please. And some of this I've touched on in terms of, unfortunately, there's a great deal of change occurring in the inpatient setting right now that can unfortunately impact um, infant feeding and breastfeeding. Again, it's important to note that support is important and making sure that patients and their support persons are informed of the different uh, practices and recommendations that we're doing is still important. Advocating is key. And again, a plan. What is someone going to do if they are COVID positive and or PUI and need support or resources post-discharge? In addition to if someone is not, right? Unfortunately, again, as I mentioned previously, we're seeing the closure of outpatient clinics. Folks are not offering in-person um, assessments or lactation support. How are folks going to get to the services and resources that they need to maintain and support breastfeeding? And even if they're formula feeding, how are they going to get the resources and support that they need? We need to be thinking about these issues and having discussions around them. Next slide, please. And similar to, um, as I've mentioned before, during the postpartum period, assessing, educating, reorientation of expectations, connecting and advocating is so important. Because we have to remember right now, um, those of us who have platforms and power and um, the ability to advocate for those who are not in positions to advocate right now, we need to use our power positions platforms to do so. And so I think it's very critical that we have these discussions. In addition, during the postpartum time, how are we connecting individuals to the resources that they need? Um, and again, what type of plan is in place um, to support their decisions? Next slide, please. Just two more slides and then I will transition. Um, in regard to, and you guys will all have access to my slides, um, in regard to formula use, because I think it's important, there is a perception that there are, that we're currently experiencing a shortage of infant formula. In reality, there's no shortage. There is, however, an inequitable distribution of infant formula perpetuated by formula companies. And I could do a whole hour presentation on just that, but I will leave it there. In regard to donor human milk, using donor human milk is safe. Um, donated milk is screened um, for viruses and bacteria and processed during um, prior to being sent to hospitals. And I just want to say that there is an urgent need for donor human milk. So if you have time and the capacity, please consider donating to your local um, human milk bank. Um, I also think that um, I also want to share that there are resources available in your communities. I can't um, say enough about um, the folks. Um, both community-based organizations and lactation support persons that have transitioned um, quickly to providing telehealth services. Um, I will provide a list to BMMA for you all to see across the country. It's been amazing. And many of those are kindred partners and collaborators of BMMA, in addition to the way in which folks are utilizing the social media platforms. It's so huge and so important. And so I just want to thank everyone who is doing that work and making that transition. And so um, I'm on the last slide in terms of key points. Again, you'll have access to these slides. I just want to share um, breastfeeding, chest feeding, and the expression of human milk are still important. Current World Health Organization and CDC recommendations are supportive of breastfeeding, chest feeding, and the expression of human milk, and that their resources are available. So if you are considering breastfeeding, chest feeding, or the expression of human milk, there are resources available. Um, we'll ha be happily providing some of those resources, but you are not alone. And um, I just want to thank you all for your time, and I look forward to answering any questions at the end of uh, the collective presentations. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Dr. Asiadu. Our next presenter is Chanel Portia Albert. Chanel is a full spectrum doula, certified lactation counselor, midwifery assistant, reproductive health advocate, and founder executive director of Ancient Song Doula Services. Her work within infant and maternal health have led her across the globe to Uganda, where she has served as a maternal health strategist in rural world torn areas to address the lack of resources to birthing mothers. Chanel has also served as a consultant on various advisory boards throughout the country, such as the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, engaging policymakers, public health professionals, and providers in birth justice. I will now turn it over to Chanel. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, greetings, and um, I hope everyone is well on this day. And so today I'm going to be talking to you about understanding the impacts of racism and bias um, in the face of COVID-19 and how to support nurses and others in connecting um, services in response to that. Um, given the time, I'm going to go through my slides very quickly, um, but you will have an opportunity to um, ask questions because I wanna be mindful of my colleague who is after me, Dr. Davis, and make sure that she has enough time to present. Next slide, please. Um, and so as we know, um, COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting Black people um, and Black pregnant people as well. And so um, as my colleagues have said, have said previously, in certain states where as um, race has been identified as, uh, has, been, has been traced um, with the COVID-19 cases, we have seen um, in some states where 70% of the individuals who are contracting and thereby the mortality rate um, has been affected um, by black and brown people um, disproportionately. Next slide, please. So how does that affect um, one in accessing care when they are pregnant during this time? Next slide, please. I think I, we need to talk about how healthcare needs to be a value neutral field in which is not and so I really wanted to um, really uplift uh, Betsy, Anaka, and Lucy for their contributions within the field of medicine as not only uh, being nurses um, and uh, acquiring a level of education that was set at a time that they could not, but also as being, as giving up um, of their bodies, not by their own free will, to advance the, the, the medical field um, today. Next slide, please. And so what we have seen has been the impact um, in particular within New York City and parts of New Jersey is that um, there is a level of fear and anxiety that has, is perpetuating individuals in accessing care. We have received a overflux or influx of individuals who are making decisions um, that they probably otherwise would not based on the fact that they are um, experiencing um, a myriad of different emotions at one time. We've seen medical neglect um, being not seen as a high priority within care, how insurance segregation has been, um, how insurance segregation has also played a heavy role in who has access to being treated immediately and not. Forced isolation through separation of partner support uh, whether it be familia uh, and or a doula, unfounded child removal. And so based on um, someone maybe being, or the perception that someone may, may have been exposed um, and not, um, and children being removed um, from their parents 14 days, uh, for 14 days post um, delivery, unresponsive or dismissive of triggers within care and refusal of bodily autonomy and the human rights, their basic human rights within the access of, of care during this time. Next slide, please. So maternal mortality was an issue before the crisis and it still pertains, it hasn't left because now we're in a pandemic. And so we, we're coming against a situation where um, the question about whose life is worth saving during this time. Next slide, please. And what we have to really start to do within the healthcare system is to deconstruct idealism within this crisis in situations in order to center the patient and the provider. 
a sense of blind idealism within the context of healthcare doesn't um, serve the patient, nor does it serve the provider in being able to provide care that centers them as well, so that they can center the needs of the patient and provide a human rights framework and bodily autonomy. Next slide, please. We, under, we need to understand this, that we need to say to this med well, and this, I love this because this was, um, I pulled this together today in terms of this particular um, tweet. And it was so timely because um, we have a medical student who says race is a social construct. There is more genetic diversity within races than between races and racism, not race is the primary reason for race-based disparities. And as my colleagues, um, my colleague, Dr. Uh, Joy Care Perry has said time and time again, it is not our race that has bound us to um, what we are experiencing. It is the racism that we continue to endure within accessing healthcare services. Next up, slide, please. And so it's important for us to center those who are on the front lines, who have the opportunity in which to be able to uplift care in a way that centers um, people and individuals so that they can be seen, they can be heard, and they can know that someone genuinely cares about them. Next slide, please. But before we can do that, we must first center ourselves in order to center others. We must understand that the nurse who is there, who is providing that care is experiencing a level of residual trauma un unlike any that they have probably ever experienced before in their lives in trying to provide adequate services to care um, to individuals who are there. We received, um, I received notices from nurses who were asking, how can I help to mitigate some of the things that I'm seeing in terms of forced isolation, um, bodily autonomy not being met, uh, human rights frameworks um, uh, or the basic human rights of individuals to hold their babies, to birth their babies, to feed their babies, to bond with their babies not being met um, while still continuing to do this work so that I can center myself and, and be safe at the same time. And so we really have to think about what does that mean? Next slide, please. And that means that we have to center equity and education. We need to center the emotional, physical, and the spiritual aspects of the individual that is presenting before us. We need to understand that managing stress and triggers is essential in the care uh, and understanding the person that is before us. That because when they came into the situation prior to COVID-19, they were a person who had already been um, experiencing historical traumas based on medical healthcare systems, based on um, various different uh, housing insufficiency, food insecurity, environmental factors, and, and the like. Uh, we need to center comfort measures for hospital-based births that understand what it means to um, provide comfort even if you cannot ne necessarily physically touch a person. Understanding and supporting undetermined birth outcomes and what that looks like and being able to respond in a way that um, centers the individual and does not further exaggerate a situation. Center a cultural humility framework, understanding that each patient, although they are experiencing um, a pandemic, we are not experiencing it all the same. We need to understand that a human rights framework, as my colleagues have said previously, does not stop just because the pandemic is taking place. And so the centering of bodily autonomy, because we would want it centered for ourselves, is highly important. And it, comes, it needs to come from a, a perspective of trauma-informed care um, that centers the individual while centering themselves and understanding that you too, as a provider, are experiencing that residual trauma that can last for up to 24 to 48 hours. And if that trauma continues to perpetuate itself in high volumes, that you will, um, you will need way, active ways to be able to center yourself to continue to do the work that you are doing um, in a way that is healthy. Next slide, please. Um, we need to connect to community-based doulas and others who are providing that care that is centered in trauma-informed care that understands the impacts of intergenerational trauma and how they will show up within that birth room, even outside of the fact that there is a pandemic. We have to understand that the historical memory index in relation to the Black body is ever-present and is ever-real um, at all stages of someone accessing healthcare services. We need to approach care from a humble perspective that understands that I do not understand and understanding that we are willing to listen to the individual. We are taking a step back. We are 
um, looking at the intersections and the social determinants and understanding what those unintended outcomes could look like um, in a way that um, provides resources uh, that center that individual. Next slide, please. We need, to, uh, we need to center human connection, compassion, and empathy because that re re residual trauma may show up in disassociation, physical pain, disorientation, disbelief, anxiety, and panic. Um, and that panic is not only, again, experienced by the person, the birthing person, but also those who came in contact with that person who know that there are better ways in which to be able to provide medicine and care, but are unable to do that at a time when it is most critical. Next slide, please. And we need to keep that same energy. We need to keep the same energy that we have when we are um, a, a fighting energy, an energy that is of upliftment, an energy that is centered in hope, a centered, a energy that is centered in pride. Um, I had to pull from um, the first Black um, African-American Army nurse, um, uh, Susie King-Taylor, who um, was on the front lines, who was providing care, who was not centered, but who chose to center herself in order, that, in order to center other people. Next slide. Um, and because when we do that, then we're able, to, um, we're able to center people in a way that makes them feel, cent makes them feel whole and makes them feel safe. And so even though they may have an outcome that was necessarily intended, even though it's an outcome that wasn't necessarily what they may have wanted, to know that someone is caring, has their, cares for them, and has their best um, uh, feelings and uh, compassion and whole centeredness at heart is what really matters. Um, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chanel. Our next speaker for today's webinar, and she is our last speaker, but definitely not the least, because we love her, Dr. Nastasia K. Davis. Dr. Davis is a licensed re registered nurse with over 14 years of experience in perinatal nursing. To complement her nursing background, she became an international board certified lactation consultant in 2009. And most recently, she um, was appointed to assistant professor of nursing at Montclair State University. Over her career, Dr. Davis has developed a passion for eliminating disparities in Black infant and maternal health. Her research and clinical interests include implicit bias and racism in healthcare, breastfeeding in Black community, obstetrical violence, and reproductive justice. And in 2018, she founded the Perinatal Health Equity Foundation, where she serves as the executive director. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Davis. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, yes, so can. thank you. Good. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Angela, for that introduction. Um, I want to wish everyone a happy Black Maternal Health Week. Um, as Angela stated, my name is uh, Dr. Nastasha Davis. Um, I am a uh, assistant professor at Montclair State University, and I also um, and the founding executive director of the Perinatal Health Equity Foundation, uh, which is in New Jersey. Um, it is an honor to have been invited here today. And uh, my presentation is going to really focus on um, PPE, OB unit protocols, and um, telehealth. Um, so I'm actually gonna skip through the next couple of slides because I think my colleagues have already done a really good job explaining that. So if you could go next slide. Keep going, keep going. Keep going. Okay, so um, protective measures. Um, hand washing is, uh, as we know, the most important factor um, in eliminating the virus. And I'm, I'm highlighting that, uh, this picture here, because it's not just hand washing, it is uh, performing proper hand hygiene, which is uh, really, really important. Um, so this is a quick slide that gives you uh, the steps that are necessary to thoroughly clean your hands. As we know, that is a 20 second um, wash that we're doing. Next slide. Uh, I think it skipped a slide. There are two slides in between, yep, there we go. So I wanted to make our own playlist of um, our 20 second song. So here is um, our culturally centered list of uh, 
songs that you can use to wash your hands for 20 seconds by just by singing the chorus. So I'm not going to sing them for you, but I'm sure you guys know all of these songs. Um, if you sing the chorus, that is 20 seconds of hand washing. Next slide. So I want to talk about gloves in public quickly. Uh, gloves are necessary, yes, to, um, to prevent transmission of disease, but they are really not meant for public consumption of wearing gloves in public. Um, what I'm finding, and I think a lot of us are seeing, are gloves are being worn from store to store, um, and it really does increase contamination of everyone who's in contact with the objects that that person touched. So it is really best practice to, um, if you need to go out in public, wash hands where you can, um, but also carry your hand sanitizer with you um, so that you are not contaminating everyone else by you wearing the gloves. Next slide. Um, can you go back? I think there's a slide on the gloves that, I, that should be after this one. Yep, this one. So there is actually a technique to removing gloves, and I just want to highlight this really quickly. If you are someone who um, now needs to wear gloves because you are providing care that you didn't have to before, um, I just wanted to quickly go over the process for removing gloves. Um, the process is designed so that you do not contaminate yourself in the process of removing your PPE. So you really do need to grab the inside of the glove as is um, shown here. You're, you're touching really the, the outside to kind of get a grip on it to pull it off. You're pulling that glove off, you're putting one glove inside the other hand, and then with your clean hand, reaching inside the other glove to pull it off completely, disposing them all as one unit together. So it's, it's important to not just wear the gloves if you, if you need to wear them, but also uh, remove them properly so that you do not contaminate yourself in the process. Next slide. So masks. Uh, we know now that the uh, new recommendation is that we wear masks um, in public um, I just want to reiterate that the N95 masks are really designed for healthcare providers. They do require fit testing. And so if you were using a mask that you have not been fitted for, um, you do risk, the, um, risk getting yourself contaminated by using an improperly fitted mask. Um, so if you do need to wear a mask, um, you want to make sure that you are not contaminating yourself in the process of removing it. Um, if you are not used to wearing a mask, um, what I'm seeing in public as well is there's a lot of touching of the face while the mask is on because you're just not used to wearing a mask. Um, we all need to just make a conscious decision not to touch our face or adjust the mask while we're out in public because the face is the danger zone. That's where you have the um, open areas where you could contaminate yourself. So just please be mindful that if you are wearing a mask in public that you are not touching your face in that process. Um, if you are wearing gloves, for example, um, you want to remove your gloves first, um, wash your hands or hand sanitize, and then if you need to, re uh, to remove the mask, you want to remove the mask from the back. Um, that area is considered um, cleaner, and so you won't contaminate yourself in the process. And then after you have removed the mask, wash your hands again. Um, Masks do not take the place of using that six feet of distance. So it is not um, a free license to get closer to people. It is just to really protect yourself and prevent the spread. So if you are wearing a mask, you still need to maintain um, that six feet of distance. Next slide. So I want to also address um, telehealth. Um, and I want to just reinforce the statements by um, Dr. Efinwa about um, the access to telehealth. Um, being able to use telehealth really is um, a, pri a privilege and not everyone has access to that, um, to the technology that is necessary to provide telehealth services or to pay for telehealth services. Um, many insurance companies have said that uh, they will pay for telehealth services. However, credentialing is required for that to happen. And so many families are under a false pretense that they have access to telehealth services um, when they may in fact not have access to those services. So I think that's an important, important conversation to have as well. Um, telehealth can only fill in some gaps. Uh, some care really does require hands-on care delivery. And um, some of my, my colleagues have gotten really creative with trying to um, fill in some of those gaps by offering uh, provider list offices where if someone does not have access to telehealth, that they have telehealth set up in an area that is 
um, open and um, not with other patients where the provider can then provide um, telehealth remotely from that setting and then the rooms are cleaned um, and broken down for the next patient coming in. Um, in the lactation world, we're leaving scales um, at the door um, so that people, the uh, parents can weigh their babies so that we can pick up any breastfeeding um, disorders that might be happening as a result of feeding. And then I'm also seeing um, way stations and offices that are again providerless where someone can come in and uh, weigh their baby um, and then report that information back. So people are doing telehealth visits from the car. So I think people have gotten really creative with how they provide um, this service. Next slide. So when you provide telehealth, there are actually some guidelines in doing so. Um, and so traditionally, the um, Department of Health and Human Services requires that um, providers who are using uh, telehealth services, that it, it is HIPAA compliant. And for um, a service to be um, HIPAA compliant, it requires that the provider signs a business associate agreement, which is essentially an agreement between the provider and a contractor um, for accessing um, public uh, protected health information. And so not doing so can result um, in fines. Uh, but due to COVID-19, um, the Department of Health and Human Services has lifted um, that guideline and is uh, basically stating that um, you can use other services to provide telehealth um, if you do not have access to um, a HIPAA compliant software. Next slide. So these are some of your options. Um, they have said that you can use uh, Zoom, that you can use FaceTime and Skype, but we do need to acknowledge that these services are not privacy protected and we should be making an announcement to the um, client if they are using these services that there is risk for um, privacy invasion because they are not protected services. So that does not mean that these are services we should be using, but it is an acknowledgement that in order to get a business agreement, it is usually a paid service, which is going to put um, the, the provider out of pocket to provide those services. So they are offering this if there are financial constraints in which someone cannot um, provide um, a HIPAA compliant telehealth service. Um, and I just want to mention with Zoom as well, it has now defaulted to using a password uh, because people have a lot of free time on their hands. Um, Zoom bombing has become a thing where people jump into your Zooms and do very distasteful things. So using a password to protect that conversation will help to reduce uh, that from happening. Next slide. I do wanna highlight some um, services that are free and are HIPAA compliant. Um, DoxyMe, VC, and Amazon Chime are all um, services that are HIPAA compliant um, and are free. Next slide. And this is a list of um, some services that are um, paid services but are reasonably priced. So if you have um, a Google account where you have a, B, a business associate agreement, you can use Google Hangouts. Um, Spruce is another service, which is a, actually a text health services that you can use. Um, some EMRs have this service built in as well. So if that's a service that you already subscribe to, um, you can get access to using telehealth services there. And then GoToMeeting also has a protected um, platform as well. Next slide. So moving on to unit protocols. Uh, next slide. So these are the testing requirements um, as per the CDC for um, pregnant women who are suspected to have COVID-19 or um, are persons of interest. So um, there should be testing done on admission. So I'm going over what the CDC states should happen. I recognize that this is not what's happening in most cases, um, but these are um, the recommendations. Um, testing of infants with suspected COVID-19 um, and then isolation for our healthy infants if there is a suspected case. Um, there aren't very many um, infant cases. Uh, there was a, um, an infant death recently, um, but again, these are recommendations and not ideally what is happening in, in practice. Next slide. 
So the CDC um, actually on Friday updated their recommendation um, due to some hard work with some colleagues um, who are in Lack World, which is a um, breastfeeding support group on Facebook, uh, Facebook a, a space for lactation professionals on Facebook. Um, they had a new uh, update where they are now backing away from the separation. Uh, they really, in their guidelines, encourage separation. They have now changed their wording to include that it is a uh, mutual decision between the family and the provider and not an automatic separation. Um, some factors that they said to consider in doing that separation are the clinical condition of um, the mother and the infant, um, if both the mother and the infant are positive, the desire to breastfeed, uh, which again should continue in the face of COVID-19, and the facility's ability to accommodate the separation. In, in many cases, um, there just isn't the space um, to perform that separation anyway. Um, next slide. So if you are choosing to room in, these are the recommendations for preventing transmission to the baby. If this is a COVID-19 positive mother, um, that we try to keep the baby in an isolate at least six feet away from the mother. You could use a curtain to separate. Um, skin to skin should continue, um, and it can be done safely with a mask in the labor and delivery room. So COVID-19 is not a reason to stop skin to skin from occurring. Uh, skin to skin is extremely important with the transition from intrauterine uterine to extrauterine life and, and should continue. Um, the mother should wear um, PPE during direct care um, and breastfeeding. And then again, just reinforcing the importance of hand washing, um, consistently hand washing. Uh, next slide. Um, for a mother who is positive, um, there are, uh, these are kind of the all clear signs. There's a lot of questions about when you should be able to come off of isolation. The recommendation is a 14 day isolation. Uh, the new rec the recommendations are 72 hours with no meds um, and no fever. Symptoms have improved and then there have been seven days since the last symptoms. And this is um, most recent from the CDC. Next slide. So a, if there is an asymptomatic um, birthing person and they are in the labor room, um, there, there have been some reversals, again, with having the support person in the room. That person should be wearing PPE, um, gown and gloves, and when providing direct care. Uh, they, mothers may request an early discharge um, to avoid contact. So I'm seeing discharges um, within 12 to 24 hours. Um, the key here is that there should be a follow-up plan with the provider. And what I am finding, unfortunately, is that mothers are being abandoned during this time, specifically Black mothers, where their providers are no longer returning phone calls. Um, they are no longer um, providing postpartum visits, um, even via telehealth or through phone calls. And so I think we really need to be careful with making sure that there is access to postpartum education. Uh, nurses on the maternity units in some cases are being pulled down to COVID units, which is stripping their staff. And so the discharge teachings that we would normally give have been shortened. And so there is, uh, we know that this period is the highest risk for complications such as recurrence of um, preeclampsia for postpartum hemorrhage. And so if we are not doing our due diligence and teaching um, what to look for during this period and providing um, correct emergency procedures for how to follow up with this. We, we are putting our mothers at risk. Um, so just be aware that uh, we do need to do more teaching in that area. Next slide. Okay, if the mother is positive and in in is in the NICU, um, the recommendations that many hospitals are following is that the mother is not able to visit the baby during that time um, that would apply to the support person who was in the room. So if that support person has been in contact with the positive mother, that support person is also not allowed to go into the NICU. And so I think um, every hospital is following their own guidelines and not necessarily following the CDC guidelines and hospitals that have already been problematic for Black mamas are going to continue to be problematic. And I have really called for um, publicizing of these policies of what different hospitals are doing to um, manage the COVID-19 situations on their birthing units because each hospital is doing something 
different. Uh, next slide. Um, and then this just pertains to discharge. Uh, this is not going to be possible in all circumstances. If a uh, birthing mother is going home on her own, she does not have the option of having a different care member take care of that baby. Um, and maintaining six feet of distance while trying to care for your baby is not the most realistic either. Um, but we do need to encourage um, the access to PPE. So when they're providing care, they're at least preventing and protecting transmission um, to their baby. And the next slides are just references um, and those hyperlinks can be shared as well. And so with that, I'll turn it back to Angela, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, um, Dr. Davis. We really appreciate that. Um, thank you again to all of today's presenters for lending their time and expertise to discuss Black maternal health in the U.S. COVID-19 response. All presenters will remain on the webinar until, until the close to answer questions set, sent through the chat box. Um, but before we go to the Q&A portion, I'd like to highlight the following announcements. Be sure to join us for the rest of our webinar series throughout this week um, entitled Shifting and Advancing Black Maternal Health Policy, which is tomorrow. Improving health outcomes for Black mamas through holistic maternity, or excuse me, holistic midwifery care, um, which is on Wednesday, and centering Black mamas in practice on Thursday. All webinars will start at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Registration for these webinars can be found at the blackmamasmatter.org website. Please note that all webinar recordings will be available on our website soon. Additionally, attendance certificates and continuing education credits for now for these webinar series are not offered at this time. I will now turn it over to Rose Aka James, our national membership manager, who will be fielding questions from the chat box to our presenters. Rose? Thank you, Angela, and thank you to our presenters for their amazing um, presentations on Black maternal health and COVID-19. Um, we just had two questions um, that I flagged from the um, chat box. One question in particular was for, doc was for Dr. Ife Inwa. Um, folks wanted to know, what is the definition of chest feeding? Yes, I, I saw that and I did answer. So I think it's important to note not every um, pregnant and birthing person identifies as a woman, mother, or um, that they have breast. And so chest feeding is um, a way to acknowledge and identify um, the way in which our transgender and those who are um, gender fluid um, individuals um, feed their infants. And so um, it's, it's another term that we use to also acknowledge um, and be respectful that everyone um, who comes into the birthing space and or is lactating does not identify with the term breastfeeding. I hope that's helpful. Yes, thank you, Dr. Ifeinua. Um, and another question that some folks asked um, is, um, are we going to record and share the webinar? Yes, we are. Um, the webinars, of all webinars for this week will be available after Black Maternal Health Week on our website. You'll get an email from us stating when the webinars have been uploaded um, so you can view them later on. And we just ask that if you are going to um, take slides or images from folks' presentations, you make sure you always credit the individual presenter of whose slides you're using. Um, we also had a question that um, somebody posed says, can you share online resources for preparing for labor for first time moms in light of all hospital classes being canceled due to COVID-19? I can share, this is uh, Dr. Davis. Um, there is actually a virtual uh, a, a Facebook group that is um, a list of all the people who are offering virtual services. Um, I can find the link to that. Um, and put it into the chat box. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Um, we just had another question. Um, somebody asked, how do you recommend community slash health advocates to keep the energy in getting the work done when the energy shifts along with the media coverage? 
This is a really good question that I think any of our um, panelists can definitely answer. This is Monica. Um, I think we're going to get at this um, with our next webinar around policy. You know, unfortunately, you know, the omnibus um, from the Black Maternal Health Caucus was introduced a week before shelter in place happened. And I, I would like for people to understand what that is and why it's so important um, that, that that legislation continues to move forward. So I do think there were there were things that, that were introduced prior to COVID-19 that really need attention and, and making sure that, that doesn't fall off people's radar is one of the big things. This is Dr. Parrott. I agree. Thank you so much for bringing it up, Dr. McElmore. And I think that the uh, webinar tomorrow is a great place to start. And in addition to policy um, wins and sort of pushing around that, I think that we have to address this at all angles. We, you know, a policy fix alone is not going to get us the liberation we seek. So that means we need to really uh, rally around advocacy and activism. Dr. McElmore um, mentioned in her presentation that uh, permanent is what we create. Uh, and so insisting that these changes that we are demanding, that we're seeing happen because of COVID, the ones that are benefiting our community remain in place after shelter in place is gone. So advocating for uh, support for pregnant and parenting people, the importance of shifting the narrative around inequity and disparity to include a discussion of race and racism, and really um, forcing the hand of those in power to make sure that this change is sustainable in a way that benefits all of our community. Thank you, Dr. Parrott. Um, we have another question um, from attendees that says, is there any research on birthing people who are living with HIV during this pandemic? This is Monica. Um, currently, um, I know of uh, two uh, registry studies that are trying to map um, uh, birth outcomes for people who either uh, test positive for COVID-19 or who are PUIs or persons under investigation. Uh, one of those registries is at uh, the University of California, San Francisco. It's called Priority. Um, and individuals can enroll uh, where people are receiving surveys uh, over time uh, during the pregnancies. Uh, the second registry is, is going to be a retrospective registry coming out of the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, which is called the Birth Registry. Um, and that will be retrospective, so not prospective moving forward. So, you know, within the priority study, you know, UCSF, which is prospective, I can see us, uh, you know, being able to have those data. But in terms of HIV specific uh, questions for pregnant people, I would, I would definitely want to defer to other experts on the call who may know about that. Um, but I know that that will be captured as part of the, the two national registries that are one retrospective and one prospective that's moving forward. But specific to patients in the context of HIV, I am not aware of any, but that doesn't mean that they don't exist. Thank you, Dr. McElmore. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, this is Dr. Ethanwa, um, Dr. Scadio. I was just going to say I agree with Dr. McElmore, but I also remember reading. Um, an article this past week from um, one of the Dr. Um, Blackstocks in New York, who is in public health and within over the HIV work um, being conducted there in New York. I'll have to find that link. Um, I believe um, she was touching on work that they were doing or wanting to do in, reg in this regard. So thank you for the reminder, whoever asked that question, that that is also an important um, group and population that we need to be mindful of during this work or during this time, I should say. Thank you. Um, and our last question that we'll be taking today, um, uh, attendee asks, cons considering that as many preventers today have pointed out, we have been able to make quick regulatory changes such as Medicaid reimbursements for telehealth and clinicians providing care across state borders why wouldn't a state similarly authorize insurance reimbursement for home birth? This is Dr. McLemore. That's a complicated question. Um, I will tell you that there is um, some guidelines for auxiliary maternity units that are being circulated um, and that there are people who are discussing uh, the provision of maternal care uh, for home birth. Um, part of the reason why that's a complicated question is because it has to do with liability and liability insurance. 
Um, and it also has to do with uh, oversubscribing uh, the, the home birth workforce um, in terms of people who, who were already uh, supporting people pre-COVID and already had pregnant clients. Um, and so it, it's complicated in a lot of different ways. Um, but I do think building out birth center and home birth uh, is super important um, and a necessary component to this. But again, if our, our, our focus, exclusive focus has been on inpatient settings, then, then getting people to understand this discussion, and this conversation um, really has to be a collective effort. Um, and I do think that, that those are the conversations that we should be pushing to have. Okay, thank you all um, for your answers and for your questions. That's all the time we have today for our um, question and answer segment. I'll now turn it over back to Angela. Thank you so much, Rose, and thank you to all of our panelists from today. And thank you so much to all of our webinar participants. We hope you gained a new understanding of Black maternal health and the U.S. COVID-19 response by attending this webinar and will and will use this knowledge in your daily work to become champions of Black maternal health rights and justice. You can continue to engage with us throughout the Black Maternal Health Week campaign by following us on all of our social media platforms and through the hashtag BMHW20. Visit our website for additional information about the Black Mamas Matter Alliance. Sign up for our newsletter to be involved in our initiatives. With sincere gratitude for your attendance for today's webinar, we thank you. Have a good one.